Introduction to computer forensics. Um, it was already on the sheet, um, and you saw the sheet. Um, um, what it is not computer forensics, and what security isn't either, is <coughs> a hacking class. Like I mentioned previously, uh, you will learn a lot of technical things and a lot of potentially dangerous things. Um, we are going to discuss these techniques, um, but we're going to discuss them only. We're not going to actually do most of them because uh, many of these uh, hacking or especially the cracking techniques and the, uh, the difference between them will become clear later on are frankly they're just illegal by law so that that's already why i mentioned uh, be care very careful of how you apply your knowledge if you do the wrong thing you might be breaking the law and especially if you're new to this and you don't know how to conceal your tracks if you do intend to do the bad things, and you're going to end up in a whole lot of problems. <clears throat> what it also isn't is a course in commercial toolkits or even non-commercial toolkits. That's all fine and interesting and very important, but those are just tools. They are just tools. Nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. We will obviously <coughs> discuss them, and we might even demo them we have access to them or not, it's not really important right now. It's also, it has nothing to do with CSI. If you came here with the, uh, somehow this, this uh, glorified thought that you would be able to solve the most interesting and complex murder cases in less than 24 hours, I strongly recommend throwing, either throwing away this DVD collection or, it, it's really not about that. It, there is a lot of geekiness involved and highly technical stuff but it usually comes at the end that's when the payoff is and the whole amount of time before that was a lot more than 24 hours this is also why Alex mentioned you need to start now start planning now and don't think you can have this uh, CSI style miracle uh, find evidence find at the end it's also a lot more than computer forensics. This will also become abundantly clear during the course. There's a, a computer is not just the device you have on your table right now. We mean with computer forensics, digital forensics, in the sense that it concerns everything that is electronic, an ele electronic device of any kind. So there will also be discussion about embedded devices, industrial systems, um, we're hoping for a guest lecture, for instance, for, by Fox IT about mobile forensics. Very interesting when it comes to tapping uh, GSM networks and so on. So it's a lot more than just the computer. So what it definitely is, is a lot of boring legal stuff. Law enforcement, you will see this uh, abbreviation frequently, LE or LEOs, law enforcement officers. I am, however, not a lawyer. We're trying to get a... Uh, a guest speaker who is a lawyer or and or knows about IT law. This is difficult because these people are very rare, actually. Um, however, I can tell you some stuff from personal experience by, uh, because I have done some cert work and maybe Elmer as well in, the, in this case. Um, actually, you might be able to give some examples. Um, even though you are not a licensed investigator uh, of any kind, either uh, governmental or private, um, you are exposed to the law, so by osmosis you do learn a bit about what you can and cannot do. It's a lot of blood, sweat and tears, unfortunately. Once again, this goes back to what Alex said about planning. 99% um, is uh, grunt work, boring digging, and, and trying to sift through tons of information. Um, for that 1% of enlightenment, this moment of Zen, you find something. So persistence is very important. It's very easy to throw in the towel or to, even if you think you found this magical bean in the, uh, or this magical needle in the haystack, to think, okay, that must be it and drop everything. But an investigator will use all of the allotted time for the investigation to find as much as he or she can. You never just stop. It's also a lot of terrible paperwork. Like I said, um, for, for better or for worse, it's also a good, uh, practice run uh, for you to write your reports, even your internship reports later on. Um, the reports you will do on the case study, for instance, 
uh, falls under this category, the terrible paperwork. It's a lot of very extensive writing, complex writing to do something, uh, just to do a simple investigation, but that's just how it is. So, what is the whole forensic principle? Because that's a very important thing to consider. These are the, um, of course this is online, but this is very important stuff to learn by heart. So you can reproduce it on an exam or when someone else approaches you and asks you about it or whatever. Um, it's a very strict methodology and a very strict process of doing things. And this, this all has to do with the fact that it needs to be reproducible, standardized, objective, and very well documented. And why? Because this involves the law. If you are a forensics investigator and you do an investigation and it turns out that what you did cannot be reproduced by someone else, by doing this, the exact same steps you described, you can imagine what happens in a court case. If the contra expertise, as it's called, the counter expertise comes in and they say, well, we did the exact same things that this investigator did and we got completely different results, what do you think the reaction will be from the judge? Any guesses? <laughs> what, what will the judge say? The, there's, the, this, there's a standard terminology in English. There's reasonable doubt that you didn't <coughs> do your job correctly as an investigator and therefore I have to release you, dear suspect, because there was apparently not a proper investigation. So this is why everything you do when you start doing this case study, for instance, needs to be very explicitly and extensive, extensively documented. This is a, a, an off. It's I know everyone hates documentation, Lord knows I do, but it is very important because when it comes to proving that you did things correctly, it's only <coughs> going to be documentation. If you're very lucky, the judge might invite you as a specialist to say something about your work, but that's rare. Actually, it's mostly the law enforcement officers. So, how do you do this? This evidence <coughs> gathering to make your case. Well. A forensics investigator, you're really not interested in, the, in, in wh what happened. You, you just get a, uh, an assignment, find out as much as you can about this and this and this. See if you can piece together, most importantly, a timeline of events. Can you provide, the, uh, uh, the, the law enforcement usually asks you or a company that uh, hires you, can you produce a timeline of events, what happens around this person when it comes to his email, for instance, or whatever the case is? And <coughs> that's what you're producing. You're not going to be doing anything else. And how do you do this? Well, please note that this is not digital. There's nothing about digital technology yet in this. These are all very generic principles. This is an important realization I want you to have. Any subject or suspect, however you name it, when you go somewhere, if, even if you're, you're right here, you're right here right now, you're already modifying, accessing, or changing things when you're here. Because you're logging in on systems, uh, um, you're here, you might have checked in somewhere, you might have paid your parking. You are changing a lot of information in the world around you. So once again, nothing technical yet. Just by being here at this time. And that's the inf interesting stuff for a forensics investigator. And why? Because you can cross-reference this information, usually. And if you do a good job, you can cross-reference it with a lot of uh, in external information. A very simple example, which <coughs> is maybe a bit technical, but who here, is there anyone here who has his mobile phone turned off by any chance? As in power off. That's what I thought, nobody. But do you understand why I'm asking this? Why am I asking this in this context? Well, very specifically, you are now being recorded, at least your mobile phone is being recorded as being present here. And why? Because your mobile phone has a connection to several cell towers. So they can triangulate very roughly where you are. But you can imagine that in a, in a case, uh, a very simple things that forensic investigators do quite regularly is checking if a suspect is at a 
place somewhere. And one of the same things could be, well, let's for instance say we have phone data and he was at this place at that time and we actually have a phone call, maybe, where he's speaking and the phone is registered to be in that location and the suspect, uh, uh, apparently the police thinks the suspect was in a different location doing something very nasty, perhaps, and as the forensic investigator you find, hmm, these two things don't match by cross-referencing, you can start building a case in favor or against and so on. It's just mostly about correlating data, what you do as a forensics investigator. And the more information you manage to combine, to relate, cross-reference, reference, or combine, or wha whatever you do with that, the better your case will be. So, if you do this properly, the forensics investigator can deduce things. Then you can, very, very uh, uh, Sherlock Holmesy, you can deduce things. <coughs> I do want you to realize that this is a very important misconception, and um, that's why I explicitly put it in the sheet. Um, even last year, we had this in the, in, in the sheet information and we talked about this frequently, we had students who turned in their case report and said, the suspect has done this and this. And when I read that, the first thing I do is take the big red pen, I'm exaggerating, we don't use those anymore, but, and, sorry, fail, the case study. A forensic investigator never ever makes that decision. That's up to the judge. You present your case, and this is why you always say, as a forensics investigator, you have different grades, different levels of how certain you are that something has transpired. You can never be completely certain. There is no 100% certainty. And when a judge asks you, how likely uh, do you think that, and the first thing you say is, well, he did it, there's a very specific reason that you would not say that in a report. If the con Once again, if the counter expertise comes then and they find one little detail <coughs> wrong about your report, then they, there's a problem. You were said you were absolutely certain that they, you said he did it, but then it turns out you made a mistake, which puts your whole um, yeah, well, the whole claim that you made as an investigator, you, that's very simply one of the many reasons why you never claim to be 100% certain or make such a bold statement about a case. You, the only thing you will say, like I said, if, if by any chance you might be in a courtroom or you might put this into report, it will always say, I find it somewhat likely that the suspect did this and this and this because we found such and such. And you might say, if you're very, if, if it's a pretty clear-cut case for you as the investigator, you would say, well, well, dear your honor, if you're in the courtroom, I find it exceedingly likely it's, it's that the suspect was this and this and doing that and that because of this and this evidence. That's the only thing you will say. So be very careful of how you write things down right from the beginning and what you say when we're discussing things. Okay. So there's two groups of people who are actually doing this kind of work, this forensics. The good guys. So <coughs> the police is, of course, the obvious um, uh, white hat. It doesn't get much wiser than that. The shining beacons <coughs> of uh, the exemplary uh, whatever. The law enforcement in general, um, or specialized researchers, uh, researchers that get hired by law enforcement, uh, Fox IT, uh, NFI, Hoffman, are very uh, famous. <coughs> and sometimes even companies hire uh, people from uh, different specialized companies to do this kind of work. There's the C certs and certs, several examples here. People uh, doing this kind of work. You're also one of the good guys. You operate within the law in the, in the broadest sense. There are um, <coughs> From the government, there are people who are buitengewoon opsporingsambtenaars, BOAs. Dus dat is niet zo'n ding wat je al om je nekken doet. Maar dat is, ja, dat dat someone who has a special training, special licensing to do investigations. To be uh, absolutely clear, when it comes to law cases that uh, fall under the law, it's usually 
only these people that do the investigations or give instructions to the others on what to do. <coughs> and if it's an internal company investigation, then of course it might not be the case. You don't need this. Um, <coughs> in, an, in many cases though, whatever you do as a white hat forensics person, what you are bound by common law or sometimes specialized law that are s like the telecommunications law of what you can do or the uh, kind of person who's giving you the instructions they very they give you very specific instructions of what you should do you never ever start digging yourself because you might be taint tainting the evidence of doing that so um we have actually some people who uh, are going to come over and talk about this we have uh, um, the fiscal well, the uh, fiscal, uh, well, I, I can't really translate that, uh, fiscal investigations, but the Fiat, the Fiscale Inlichting and Opsporingsdienst. Is anyone familiar with these people? <coughs> the Belastingdienst. <coughs> we, uh, we asked them, would you be interested in coming over? And the first thing they said, yeah, just, uh, just say when. They love doing that, coming to talk about their work. Um, I think we're reasonably sure now that we also have someone from the regional police coming in, a, uh, from the team High Tech Crime. Uh, Chris Ornink, probably familiar name again. See, like I said, it's familiar names. Everyone <coughs> knows everyone. Um, who's coming in and he will talk about uh, uh, digital investigations, uh, how they dig for stuff on the internet. And we're uh, also planning a visit to Fox IT. Don't miss this. Like I said, it's not mandatory to do this kind of visit, but um, do try and come over. It's very interesting to visit. Unfortunately, there's also the black hat guys. The black hat forensics are uh, unfortunately in uh, existing greater number as well, sadly. And they're pretty much the exact opposite in every way. They have questionable moral standards and so on. Um, they might be bound by law, Strictly speaking, as a subject of any government, you're bound by certain law, but they don't care. They just choose to ignore these laws. And <coughs> if you are a black doing black hat forensics, this is of course not black hat hacking. We'll get into that, of course, in the security <coughs> course. But then they go out of the way to impede investigations. Uh, for instance, uh, from a company point of view, this could be someone when the uh, Fiat once again uh, decides to. Uh, do a raid, they, when they see their chance, they walk out with a, an armful of documents or cram them through the shredder or set them on fire to hide their tracks. It's a very s basic example, but these are the people who are doing the black hat things. They try to impede these investigations in any way. And they do it in many different ways. They can do it technically by using uh, root kits or wiping information, destroying it in any forms, encrypting it and then not giving out the keys or just hide, trying to hide it, or like I said, even burn it if it's paperwork. And like I said, the problem is, is that these people exist in quite a large number. To give you an idea, the, um, um, you always see when, uh, when you're watching CSI and um, NCIS and all these fantastic uh, TV shows that are highly entertaining, you see the lone hacker or maybe two or three people uh, destroying the world with the click of a button. And frankly, this is just nonsense you can probably realize it's it's a uh, highly uh, Hollywoodized version it's been and, and I'm sure you can confirm this as well and I have to deal with this from surfnet as well these uh, skirt groups I mean the people who do this now are members of the massive criminal networks and a lot of these criminal networks are for instance in Asia in Russia um, and, and the former uh, eastern states but there are also significant criminal networks here that operate and do this stuff for basically just to earn money, to make money. There, it's the always the mo key motivation in some way. Um, there is, of course, still the savvy individual that might do something intentionally or not. Um, <coughs> but I do want you to realize, like I warned previously, if you try to do security stuff or you try to do forensics and you do this improperly, or you touch stuff you're not supposed to stuff uh, touch. Well, if you're not uh, touch stuff you're not supposed to touch, in any way, you can get into trouble. It's the same with forensics. You are not in, in many cases. You're not legally allowed to use certain kinds of data in a certain way, and so on. So be careful. 
if you are unsure, if but but by the same token, I want to reiterate that if you're unsure and you want to do this stuff, and you don't want to risk anything, just come to me and Elmer, talk to us and see what kind of possibilities if we can make some kind of setup where you can do this and not break the law. We're more than happy to facilitate you if you want to do certain kinds of technical work. But we need to be careful that we do this within the confines of the law. Um, okay, and be careful with your terminology. This is uh, something the media hasn't learned yet either, the difference between uh, hackers, crackers, and so on. Um, the hackers are the good guys. Really, hacking in the strict definition of the term is always a good guy. And hacking has nothing to do with breaking into things. Hacking has everything to do with making any kind of equipment, digital or not, doing something it wasn't originally intended for or envisioned for by the designer. If you f figure out a new way to do your tie <coughs> so it looks even nicer than the common four ways to fold your tie and make it look nice, that's also, strictly speaking, hacking of some kind. You, you do something new that wasn't origi originally thought of. And for digital stuff, this can be um, somehow managing to install new software on your router so it, it suddenly has different functionality than the uh, manufacturer gives to you. This is very common stuff that some of you, I'm sure, have done. Just upgrade the firmware to something that has different functionalities. That's all hacking. Crackers are people who do the bad stuff, in the same sense. They do this with some kind of game to impress people or whatever. More about that in security. And script, script kiddies are the people on the bottom of the food chain that are doing the bad things, but they're too stupid to think of this themselves. And they just want to click on tools, press a big red button and see what they can break. That's about the idea of a script kitty. And it is also tempting um, if you start uh, happily uh, using Nmap. I always see students happily typing Nmap and starting to scan entire uh, networks, you're a script kitty, and you're triggering a lot of alarms if you do that. Just so be careful with what you do. It's easy to end up in one of the wrong categories. If you need a good book, get this one. It's old. However, it's free, and it's the standard work. This is universally recognized as the definitive uh, my first forensics information book, whatever you want to call it on uh, digital forensics at least. Mm -hmm. Dan Farmer and Witsuveno are still very active in the uh, speaking circuit. I think they're actually also coming to the, uh, the Worldwide Symposium I mentioned earlier. Witsuveno, I think, is there. One of the uh, famous people, as it, as it were. It's a bit dated, I know, if you look for it. But it's the definitive work. Much like uh, you're, you're all familiar with the basics of computers and basics of protocols and so on, there's also standard works for that. This is the stuff for forensics. Um, it's freely available online. There's a PDF. You can download it. It really is free. They made it free. So enjoy. Uh, it's highly recommended that you read it. It will help you massively in learning for the test. Just that alone is worth the time. OK. So what are you going to do? Because we're quickly running out of time already. Um, there's going to be labs. And like I said, there will be a case study you will be required to do. It will be teams of two, not one, not three, not four. Five would be silly. <coughs> really two, that's it. Um, <coughs> and unfortunately, we have to divide the group into, uh, you all into two groups as well. It's basically because we don't have enough room to fit you all in the same classroom, the uh, lab. And I know you want to be in the first group so you can go home early, but www.dealwithit.com. Sorry, uh, <laughs> we're here the whole day. You have to be the hard day. There's simply no solution for that, so unfortunately. We're not going to make it difficult and complex with first week, then this group first, goes first, and th that kind of nonsense we're also not going to do. Just keep it simple. Um, we're going to be present for all the classes, Elmer and I. So you can always approach either of us with questions and so on, unless we're sick, of course. Um, what you will do for today, I've put it in the sheet, is you're going to start with B. 
preparing the environment for your case study. So uh, when we go to this classroom, uh, the first thing, uh, you're not going to immediately look at a computer screen. First, we're going to have a small brainstorm, more on that, of course, later, about how you make a safe environment to do your work in. <coughs> you're great for this course. You might not have noticed this in the, in the student system, but here it is again. There are two grades. One is for the report, and one is for the theoretical, the theoretical exam. We will take the, it will be done digitally through Moodle. And you have to deliver them both at the end of the course. You will need to do the test, and you, the project, the report, will need to be turned in. They're individually graded, which also means that they both need to be a five and a half or higher on a scale of 10. So don't, like previously mentioned by the guys in the back, don't underestimate the importance of the report and plan your time accordingly. So that's it. That's at least the introduction. And um, I would like to give the opportunity for you to ask more questions for now. <coughs> Nothing at all? OK. Are you guys excited or disappointed or worried or what's the overall feeling of the group? <laughs> Don't go yet. We need to make the groups. Scared? Mostly scared, I think. <laughs> Curious. OK. We'll try to get the uh, video material published as soon as possible. But I don't think it will be a lot of work. It's just copying and then uploading. So, All right.